Um, so good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this morning. I'm Chad Carter. I'm the Communications Director for the Red Cross Cascades Region. And as you know, we're experiencing a critical blood shortage right now. We're currently uh, on a nationwide appeal encouraging individuals to make an appointment if they can to donate blood. And so we really appreciate you taking the time to join us to help spread that message. Um, as I mentioned, if you are unable to record locally, we are recording this. You can contact us afterwards and we will be glad to share a link with you. We'll get it uploaded uh, and be able to provide that for you. We want to make sure that you get access to all of our, our speakers that are here with us today. Um, before we get started, we wanted to take a quick moment and share a photo with you of someone that we're going to be talking about. This is Hans Weberling and one of our speakers this morning is Hans's mom and she's going to share the importance of why donating blood is, is so valuable and what it meant to her family. And we thought it was really important for you to be able to see who she was speaking about when she talks about her beautiful son, Hans. And it's hard not to start your day with a beautiful smile uh, just like that. So with that, let me introduce our three speakers that we have with us this morning. First is Laura Weberling. Um, her young son, Hans, battled and lost his fight with cancer in 2012. Her experience needing blood during her son's uh, cancer experience inspired her to join the Red Cross as a blood services account executive because she wanted to give back. And so she's going to share a little bit of her family story. Also joining us this morning is Dr. Rachel Cook. Um, she's the OHSU medical director of the inpatient bone marrow transplant unit and also a member of the OHSU blood supply task force. So she's going to give us a little uh, indication of what they're experiencing inside OHSU and what other hospitals are likely experiencing across our region. And then finally, we have Angel Montez. He is the Red Cross Regional Donor Services Executive, and he's going to share a little bit about what the Red Cross is experiencing right now, and most importantly, how others can help. So we appreciate everybody uh, joining us this morning. And with that, um, Laura, if you would like to come off mute and you can um, get started. Thank you, Laura, for joining us this morning. Okay, thanks, Chad, and thanks everyone for having me. I always appreciate the chance to share Hans's story, especially when it can help make a difference. Our son Hans was just three years old when he was diagnosed with stage four high risk neuroblastoma back in 06. They found a large abdominal tumor off of his left kidney after a few symptoms just weren't adding up. Neuroblastoma is actually one of the more common cancers of childhood with about 700 cases a year in the US, but we'd never heard of it. The treatment protocol we found out was one of the most brutal for all cancers, including uh, pediatric or adult cancers. Hans endured five rounds of chemotherapy, two major resection surgeries, and maintenance therapy as a part of his frontline treatment. Unfortunately for Hans, he, he wound up relapsing multiple times. So although he was able to you know, achieve the status of no evidence of disease or be cancer free a few different times, he was never off treatment in his six year fight against this disease. Uh, to combat his relapse disease, we actually ended up enrolling him in children's uh, clinical trials at four different children's hospitals across the country. Um, and each aspect of treatment that was aimed at reducing his tumor burden could also create these dramatic drops in his blood counts. And cancer patients, we learned, actually really build their lives um, and their treatment plans, plans around their blood counts. And of course, so did we. Throughout treatment, that whole six year period, we would get his labs at least twice a week Sometimes when we were inpatient uh, up to every single day or even multiple times a day when things were critical, um, those labs would let us know where Hans's counts were at, where was his hemoglobin, his platelets, and his white blood counts. Um, and those labs would let you know when he was trending down and could be at risk of a transfusion or when he desperately needed a transfusion. And they also helped us track when he was tending to recover and, and come back and let us know he was actually ready for his next treatment. Sometimes we could just tell when he was in need of transfusion. If he needed red blood cells, his whole body would just be kind of limp and listless. Um, he, he would literally ask for steak. He'd be tired, he'd be exhausted. 
If he needed platelets, um, he could bruise very, very easily. He might get a terrible nosebleed or he might have those little red dots all over his skin, petechiae. So throughout treatment, he actually received over 100 blood transfusions. We tried to keep track, but we lost count. Uh, when he got a transfusion of red blood cells, you could just see him perking back up and be brought right back to life. Sometimes we'd have to wait a few hours before he got his transfusion. Every once in a while, it took quite a bit longer than that, but thankfully it usually wasn't too long. Luckily for Hans, he was O positive, so one of the more common blood types, and his type wasn't particularly hard to match. Um, you know, we always just felt gratitude for the miracle of this gift donors had offered. We were grateful that donors out there hadn't even known Hans, and yet they'd gone out of their way to make it a point to roll up their sleeve and donate their life-saving gift. And we'll forever be grateful uh, for those donors that kept our boy in his fight. For me, after we lost Hans, I really had a time where I wasn't sure how to redirect myself when it came time for me to eventually go back to work. Um, but I always say I let Hans's light guide me and I wanted to do something in service to his light. And not being a nurse or a medical professional, I wasn't sure which way to go. So when I first went back to work, I went back as a cancer research fundraiser, but I'd always kept my eye on the Red Cross and was attracted to blood donation programs. Um, I'd always been at least an occasional blood donor and I know just how important it is. When I saw this role advertised, I pretty much knew it was a foregone conclusion and it's been amazing to have joined this great team and to have a part to play in, in helping restock those shelves and making sure that blood is there for others and trying to bring as many donors through the door as possible. So I'd just like to say thank you to all of the blood donors out there, especially in this unprecedented time when your donations are so desperately needed. Thank you. Laura, thank you very much for sharing your very uh, personal and uh, moving story. We appreciate it. And we're grateful to have you as part of the Red Cross family as well. Thank you so much. At this time, I'd like to um, turn now to Dr. Rachel Cook from OHSU to share a little bit about what's going on inside uh, our hospitals. Uh, Dr. Cook, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join you today. I'm Rachel Cook, the Quality Medical Director of the Bone Marrow and Stem Cell Transplant Program at the OHSU Knight Cancer Institute and Associate Professor of Medicine, Hematology and Medical Oncology in the OHSU School of Medicine and a board donor. Before the first case of COVID-19 was announced in Oregon, OHSU and other hospitals and health systems in the Portland metro area were already dealing with shortages of blood and platelets. Nearly two years into the pandemic, the situation is now at a crisis level with fewer and fewer people donating blood. In the fall of 2021, with a severe blood shortage looming, OHSU formed a task force to strengthen the connection with our blood bank, which gets most of its blood from the American Red Cross and has knowledge of our supplies so we could tell our clinicians when supplies were really short or unpredictable so they can plan how many surgeries or procedures they can do in a day and how blood products will be allocated. In recent weeks, however, the blood shortage has become so dire that we no longer can get the quantity or type of blood required for every patient who needs it. And we've had to make some difficult decisions. Because the blood supply is dangerously low, we can no longer give some patients the blood and platelets as we normally would, such as patients with leukemia experiencing shortness of breath or bruising. We now have had to prioritize our limited supply for those who need it most, such as those who are actively bleeding, having chest pain, undergoing emergent surgeries, or whose blood counts are so low that they're in really dire straits. Because blood is so scarce, we are also having to delay some major surgeries. I can't imagine the distress patients must feel when told their surgery or procedure has been postponed. It's heartbreaking. People often ask me what they can do for their loved ones who are going through terrible illnesses, how they can help, and I can say donate blood. Um, I'm always struck by how many people have just never thought of doing it. Routine blood donors are a finite resource, and those who are donating now, who've been donating for years, they're not always going to be with us, and we don't 
necessarily have the replacement that we need. We need a new batch of people who are going to step up and donate. With a single blood donation, you can make a big difference. On the Red Cross app, you can now see where your blood has gone and how your donation is truly saving lives. And I want to sincerely thank all of the Red Cross employees, the volunteers, all the people who are tirelessly working to collect blood for our seriously ill and injured patients. Um, if you're eligible, I'd encourage you to book an appointment to donate blood as soon as you can. Your actions will help people at OHSU um, and at hospitals and health systems all around the region and all over the state. Maybe somebody you know or love. Thanks again for allowing me to join you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Cook. We really appreciate uh, your insight and sharing exactly what's going on um, inside the, the walls of hospitals all across our region. So thank you very much. Um, with that, we're going to turn it over now to Angel Montez. He's the Regional Donor Services Executive for the Red Cross, who will share a little bit about uh, the impact facing the Red Cross and most importantly, how individuals can help. Angel. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chad. I really appreciate this. So again, Angel Montez, a Regional Donor Services Executive for the Red Cross here in the Northwest region. Um, and I think before I get started, I just want to say a very special thank you to Lara and to Dr. Cook. Lara for sharing your story, Dr. Cook for sharing the experiences that you're currently dealing with right there at OHSU and within the hospital sector. We really, really appreciate that insight. Uh, the American Red Cross right now is, is facing a national blood crisis. Uh, it's uh, being deemed as the worst blood shortage in over a decade. I can tell all of you that I've been with this organization for 18 years and I haven't seen it this bad. I have never seen us uh, not be able to provide the products that hospitals need when they're requesting it. So in recent weeks, uh, you know, the, the Red Cross provides about 40% of the nation's blood supply, uh, but we've had less than a one-day supply of critical blood types. And this limits the, uh, the product distribution to local hospitals, as, as Dr. Cook had, had indicated. Uh, so we are uh, facing such a dangerous situation right now that we are making decisions, uh, is forcing hospitals in a way to make decisions about who's going to receive transfusions uh, and who's going to need to wait for uh, you know, additional products to become available. And, and that's uh, due to the, the shortage in, in, in the blood supply that we have. And at times, as much as one quarter of all blood, uh, all quarter of all hospital blood needs are actually not being met. So when we, we say that one quarter of hospital blood needs are not being met, like hospitals like OHSU, right? And it, it's all due to the product, uh, product distribution, the demand, and us not having the inventory that we need to keep up with that demand. Here in the state of Oregon and Washington, we average about 35 blood drives a day and collect between 500 to 700 units of blood. Uh, to give you an idea of, of how critical of a situation that we find ourselves in right now, uh, the Red Cross uh, has experienced a 10% decline in blood donations during this pandemic. High schools and colleges are some of our biggest uh, producers uh, where we yield the most product that we can make available to our hospitals. Uh, and we've seen a 62% drop in blood drives being hosted by these organizations. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Generation Z donors uh, accounted for nearly one quarter of all blood donors in 2019. Uh, and they just made up 10% of those donors in 2021. To compound the issues that we're dealing with right now, we've also had significant uh, weather impacts across the region that have led to over a thousand units of, of canceled uh, don donations that we could have captured and made available to hospitals, but were unable to because of the weather. Um, the critical need right now is as we've that we typically state is the critical types are O positive and O negative. O positive can be transfused into any person that has a positive blood type. O negative can be transfused into any patient, right? So that's why those blood drives are, or those blood types are so critical. So we are uh, basically asking and, and putting out a call to action at this time that we're facing an unprecedented time where we need blood donors to sign up to donate blood and help us save lives. Over the next month, over 60% of the appointments are still available for people to sign up. Uh, like Laura said, roll up your sleeve, help save that life. Uh, and that's what we're asking people to do, to go to www.redcrossblood.org or call 1-800-RED-CROSS at 
733-2767 and sign up to, to donate blood. Help us pass this very difficult time and help us ensure that our local hospitals have the blood that they need for their patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angel. So at this time, we've got just a couple of moments for questions. If anyone um, would like to ask one, you can use the raise hand feature, which is at the bottom of, the, um, of your screen under the reactions. Or if you'd like to, you could also put your name into the chat and we'll monitor that and, um, and ask as they come in. So I do see Tyson has a question. So Tyson, if you'd like to unmute yourself, um, go ahead and, and please direct your question to one of the individuals so they know which one to come off of mute. Um, I believe this is uh, to uh, Mr. Montez and Mrs. Cook. Um, sorry, I, I didn't have one picked out. Um, obviously COVID plays a big part in this. Can you speak to you know, the safety procedures and tests for people donating blood and the safety procedures and standards for Red Cross employees. Yeah, so I think I will, uh, I'll take that one on Dr. Cook. <laughs> so uh, specifically with, uh, with safety, uh, we, we take safety very seriously at the American Red Cross. Uh, we uh, obviously require that our staff are, are fully masked Right? We uh, require the spacing in between uh, you know, the, the donors and, and the staff as well uh, to make sure that we have that safety in mind. Um, and we also have uh, stringent cleaning that happens in between each donation right, to ensure that the donors that are coming in to donate are safe and that our staff are safe so that we can continue to collect the blood that we need uh, for our local hospitals. Um, so that's uh, the, uh, the important part for us. We'll also uh, include in here that um, as part of our uh, safety uh, you know, protocol, specifically with, um, with uh, ensuring the safety of our staff, is that we did go through several mandates related to uh, vaccine mandates, both at the local level um, and at the federal level. And uh, specifically our staff, uh, as of January 1st, we were very intentional as an organization uh, with making sure that our staff were, were vaccinated or in the process of being vaccinated along with any volunteers who are in person at any of our facilities. And that's extremely important because it's, uh, we want to make sure that we continue, uh, ensure the continuity of the operation, uh, but ensure the safety of the donors and ensure the safety of our staff as well. Thank you. Thank you Tyson. And are, are donors tested in some way? No, so, so donors are not tested for, um, for COVID-19 as, as they come in to donate. Um, we do have a very specific uh, FDA uh, requirements uh, that we do ask donors to, um, to basically uh, communicate to us if they've received a vaccine, you know, the type of vaccine that they, they actually received. Um, and through that, we're able to determine, uh, you know, whether uh, there's any type of eligibility constraint on that donor specifically. Um, I will also add that any donor who has, uh, is not aware of the vaccine that they received, uh, as part of our general practice, we ask them to, to wait two weeks uh, after their vaccine before they can donate blood. Thank you, Tyson. I know we've got a couple others and we're running uh, short on time, so I just wanna make sure that we have the opportunity for others to ask. Um, Lindsay Nadrich from COIN. Hey, thanks for taking the question. I'm um, not sure who this is directed at, but um, sometimes when you donate blood, it ends up going to other states. So I guess I'm asking where is the need greatest and how does the need here in Oregon compare to what we're seeing in other areas? No, I, I can take that, that question as well. <clears throat> I, I will say that the, uh, we have local hospitals, over 60 local hospitals that we provide a product to here in Oregon and Washington as part of our region. But because the American Red Cross, uh, we obviously provide product to over 40% of the nation's blood supply, right? So wherever the, the blood is needed, we work very uh, uh, intentionally uh, to make sure that um, that, that blood is sent uh, as the need uh, is, is requested. Um, there is uh, the prioritizing of blood as far as what hospitals receive that blood or, or where it goes is all managed uh, through our, uh, you know, the, the American Red Cross 
supply program. And that's how we're able to determine where the blood is actually needed. But I will say that uh, because we are a national program, uh, we make sure that the blood is needed uh, at all of our hospitals based on, on the product that we have available on the shelf. Sorry, and part of that question, how does the need here compare to other areas? Is it higher here in Oregon right now? I, I would say that on, as an, at a national level, and this is the first time that the American Red Cross has actually implemented a national uh, blood crisis appeal, um, all over the country, we are struggling with, with the same issues that I, that I highlighted a, a bit earlier. All the regions, um, uh, every single location with the Red Cross. And, and, and I should note that it's not just the Red Cross, right? Independent blood centers are also experiencing these same challenges all over the country. So our call to action is just not here locally. We obviously want things to happen here locally, but we're asking anybody all, all over the country to call 1-800-RED-CROSS, go to www.redcrossblood.org and sign up to donate blood because the blood is needed all over the country at this moment. I think Dr. Cook, did you want to respond well, to I that think, as well? I just wanted to add on to that. I guess uh, last time I gave blood, it went to Pendleton. You know, on the app, it tells you where your blood's actually given. Um, I have several patients from Pendleton, so I, of course I was delighted to see my, my blood heading out in that direction. A couple months ago, my blood went to California. Uh, that's fine too. Um, and, you know, I know we get a lot of blood for our patients from other states during different periods of time. So um, I, I, I think just to echo what Angel's saying, like it's a kind of fluid, if you will, uh, situation where blood is moving around. But I do think one of the neat things about donating is you can see where your blood is ending up. And I've had several units stay within Oregon, which always feels good. Thank you, Lindsay. We are getting a little short on time, and I know we've still got a few more questions. So I think, Fedora, you were next. Um, so let's see if we can't get these couple in before 11 o'clock. Mine is fast. Uh, Mr. Montes, I, I wanted to ask to, to confirm the numbers, some of the numbers you provided. They were for Oregon and Washington or for the country? The 10% decline in donations, 62% drop in blood drives, those, those numbers. Yeah, so that's that's for the whole country as a system. Okay, all of the numbers you provided. That's correct. Got it. Thank you. With the with the exception of, of the weather impact, I did provide a number of near, nearly over a thousand units of blood units collect uh, that were not able to be collected here in, in the northwest region due to inclement weather. That was local. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Fedor. Uh, Megan, I believe you have your hand up. Hi, thank you. Yeah, um, when I spoke to my local Red Cross in Bend a couple months back, um, one of their concerns why people weren't coming in to donate was the Delta variant. Uh, now are we kind of seeing the same kind of hesitation with Omicron being so prevalent? You know, I, I would say that that, is, that continues to be a concern, right? Uh, and different variants that, that arise due to, um, you know, the, the ongoing pandemic that we're dealing with. Um, and, and that's why it's, it's so important for everybody who's hearing this uh, to know that the American Red Cross takes safety of donors, of blood donors, safety of volunteers, and the safety of our staff very seriously. If you come in to donate blood, it'll be a, a, a safe experience, uh, and you're going to contribute heavily to our, the need that we have currently across the country and locally. Thank you. And we have one last question from Galen, uh, and this will be our final question before we uh, have to sign off for today. Galen, go ahead, from KGW. I so appreciate it, yes. So we have heard reports from several people who are consistent donors who love this cause and are really trying to rally behind it, but they've said that in their past few appointments and uh, experiences trying to even set up drives, that the, some of the events have had to be canceled because of the ongoing staffing shortages we've seen through everything that's going on. What is the scope of that challenge and what's being done to address that? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I, I want everybody to know that obviously during this pandemic, just like any, any other organization, the Red Cross continues to face you know, some operational challenges. Um, this could be due to staff being quarantined because of, of you know, COVID or uh, you know, some turnover that we potentially had at, at some point. Um, but I will say that the Red Cross is working tirelessly right now to overcome any obstacles. 
uh, to being able to set up a blood drive or to being able to donate blood. Um, in addition to that, I would add that uh, when donors go to redcrossblood.org or call 1-800-RED-CROSS, there may not be an opening available today, right, or tomorrow, or maybe uh, two days from now or three days from now, but we schedule our blood drives weeks in advance, right? So we encourage people to sign up and, and donate, uh, to actually sign up with an appointment. Uh, when we get a heavy amount of walk-in donors, it can, it, it, you know, leads to some some potential issues there with being able to, to take donors in quickly. Uh, but I will say that the most important thing for us is to make sure that people sign up uh, in the, again, not just today or tomorrow, but over the next several weeks so that we can make sure that we stabilize our blood supply. All right, well, thank you everybody. Thank you, Angel. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Thank you to Lara for uh, joining us this morning and together all highlighting the need that is currently being experienced here in Oregon, in Washington, and across the entire country. Um, that wraps up our media availability for today.